Okay, students. So now we are going to look at a new process, process of excretion. So, so far we have discussed two processes taking place in our body. One is the process of digestion and the other one was the process of respiration. So, you all know during the process of digestion, complex compounds were converted to simple forms. The body absorbed it and during the respiration process, cellular respiration takes place and during the cellular respiration process, glucose is oxidized that is in aerobic respiration and during that process carbon dioxide and water are produced in addition to the energy. So this carbon dioxide that is produced during the cellular respiration cannot remain within our body. It has to be given out. So these substances that are produced within the body during a metabolic process but they cannot be retained within the body have to be excreted out. So those substances are known as excretory products. Summation of biochemical reactions that take place in the living body is known as metabolism. So there are many biochemical reactions taking place why do we call them biochemical? Chemical reactions taking place in the living cell. And during these biochemical processes, there are wanted and unwanted substances produced. And all these biochemical processes together are known as metabolism. Now, there are many different types of metabolisms and one is what I explained to you all or what I discussed just now, the cellular respiration. So example for several metabolic activities are given below. And the first one is cellular respiration. During cellular respiration, what happens from glucose? It is oxidized with oxygen. You know this equation very well. And here carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide and water and energy are produced. Now this carbon dioxide that is produced has to be excreted out. The same way. If we take another example, the production of urea and uric acid when amino acids are broken down in the liver or what we call as the catabolism of proteins in liver. So here that is another, this is one example. Another example is the production of of urea, uric acid during catabolism of amino acid in liver. So you know what liver is, it's attached to the digestive system. Inside the liver, amino acids undergo a process called catabolism, a new term. Now here we said metabolism. All the chemical reactions that are taking place are known as metabolism. Under metabolism, there are two types. One is anabolism, where from simple components, Complex compounds are formed. In catabolism, a complex compound is broken down to more simpler components. So during this catabolism process, urea and uric acid are produced. Now these two, urea and uric acid and carbon dioxide produced during cellular respiration. 
here you can see water is produced energy is produced energy is needed for the body water is not harmful to the body but we cannot have carbon dioxide urea or uric acid accumulating in the body they have to be excreted out and these are the substances that are known as excretory substances so now we will see when metabolic processes occur in the cells necessary as well as unnecessary materials are produced so here necessary and unnecessary energy is necessary whereas carbon dioxide is unnecessary urea uric acid are unnecessary and these unnecessary materials should be removed from the body and the waste products that are produced during metabolic processes are called excretory materials so all those carbon dioxide urea uric acid these are all waste materials produced during the metabolic processes therefore we call them as excretory materials so the process where removal of excreted products produced during metabolism from the body is called excretion so this is the process of excretion so there are metabolic processes taking place to facilitate the function or the body functions because of these metabolic processes but during those processes excretory materials are produced and they have to be removed from the body and that process is called excretion now we will see what these excretory materials are and the organs or the parts of our body that help to excrete or give out these materials from the body different excretory materials organs through which the excretory materials are excreted and the form of excretion so here we have a table this column gives you the excretory materials and the excretory organ and the form of excretion now for example if we take carbon dioxide and water vapor now these are excreted through the lungs and you know how that happens when we inhale we take in oxygen when we exhale the exhale they are contains carbon dioxide and water vapor so they are we are excreting the excretory materials so how is it excreted in the form of exhaled air so this is going to be the exhaled air so carbon dioxide and water vapor then we have urea uric acid salts and water so we discussed before urea and uric acid are produced when during the catabolism of amino acids in the liver and in addition to that there are a lot of salts in our body and water all these are excreted in the form of urine and that is done by kidneys so the excretory organ is the kidney and the form in which it is excreted is urine and then we have again urea uric acid and sodium chloride as well as water that is given out in the form of sweat that is through the skin so we have skin and the form in which they are given out is sweat so here you can see there are three excretory organs the lungs kidney and skin from the lungs it's exhaled air carbon dioxide and water vapor 
kidney urine contains urea uric acid salt and water similarly urea uric acid nacl and water are excreted through the skin in the form of sweat we have already discussed the function of lungs now we will be discussing the function of the kidney and how urine is produced and the kidneys are the main excretory organs in our body which give out these two main components the nitrogenous waste products urea and uric acid in the form of urine so that is the system that we are going to discuss now in addition to that there is skin there is something common to all these excretory material what can you see here water vapor water water so water is produced as a by product in cellular respiration but do you know that we need water but if there is too much of water in the body that is also not good so that has to be excreted out that is why with all the components there is water and also it acts as a medium to remove all these excretory substances so students you have to remember the different excretory materials the three different organs that excrete these materials and the form in which all this excretion is done with that i will move on to the question why fecal matter is not an excretory substance you know what fecal matter is or what feces is what is it it is the undigested materials in the digestive system feces is the undigested materials of the digestion process and where does that accumulate it gets collected in the large intestines and it is in the form of feces and when it is filled up there is a certain amount of feces in the large intestine it fills up the rectum and from the anus it is given out passed out of the body there we say passing out of feces we don't call it excretion of feces remember it is not excretion why because feces is not an excretory substance so digestion takes place within the digestive system that you know and digestion of food is not a biochemical reaction so digestion of food is not a biochemical reaction now we said excretory substances are produced during the biochemical reaction so since this is not a biochemical reaction that takes place in the cell therefore feces is not an excretory product so feces is not considered as an excretory material so feces is not considered as an excretory material but you know that there are bile pigments what is the organ or the part of the digestive system that produces bile it's produced in the liver stored in the gall bladder and it is secreted into the small intestine and the bile pigments that are present in bile are added to feces or they are excreted with feces because they are produced within the body during metabolic processes they are excretory products the bile pigments that is released with feces is an excretory substance so this is something that you have to remember so feces is not an excretory substance because it is undigested material and because it is not produced during a metabolic process in the cell but the bile pigments they are excretory substances so you know the three different main excretory substances exhaled they are urine and sweat and the three organs related to it now we will go into detail about the excretory system or the urinary system of our body
urinary system. The main organ that carries out nitrogenous excretion is the kidney. I mentioned this before. The nitrogenous excretion. Why urea and uric acid are the two main nitrogenous waste products that are produced or excretory materials that are produced during metabolic activities. Urea and uric acid. So the main organ that carries out nitrogenous excretion is the kidney. So you have to remember this, the kidney. A pair of kidneys and other organs are organized to form urinary system. So there are a, a pair of organs, that is the kidneys, those are in pairs. From the kidneys there are ureters that are also pairs to tubes that bring the urine that is produced within the kidney into the next structure that is the bladder. And urine is temporarily stored within the bladder and it is excreted out. When the bladder fills, you get the urge to pass urine and urine is excreted out through the urethra. So those are the parts or the main parts of the urinary system. So the main parts of the urinary system, I said there are a pair of kidneys. Then there are a pair of ureters. So the urine that is the main nitrogenous waste product is produced within the kidneys. It is transported from the kidney into the bladder via the ureters. And inside the bladder urine get stored for some time or temporarily stored. And when the bladder fills up urine is excreted through the urethra. So these four parts are the four main parts of the urinary system. And now that you know the main parts, now we will see how it looks like in a diagram. So next we will look at the parts of the urinary system. So as I told you there are a pair of kidneys. So here you can see the pair of kidneys. So kidneys. Or we can see a pair of kidneys. I will just write it as kidneys. The same way here you can see there are a pair of ureters. So this is one ureter that is coming from the, what is that kidney? That is the left kidney. This side we have the right kidney. So the two ureters coming from the kidneys. Then these ureters open into this structure. What is that? That is the bladder. And here we have the urethra. Through that urine is excreted out. Urethra. So part of the excretory system, we have a pair of kidneys, pair of ureters, a bladder and the urethra. But in addition to that, there are certain parts of the circulatory system or the blood vessels that are important for the function of this system. Let's see what those are. Now here you can see this particular white color structure that is the systemic artery. So this is the systemic artery. Now from this systemic artery, it comes from the heart, you can remember that. Here there are two arteries going to the kidneys. So those are the arteries that supply blood to the kidneys. And they are known as the renal arteries. Renal arteries. So from the systemic artery which comes from the heart, to renal artery. So this goes to the right kidney, this goes to the left kidney. And also if you look at the picture closely, you can see the le left kidney is slightly above and the right kidney is slightly below. 
and you all know the position of the kidneys in your body. And above the kidneys, there are actually two structures that are known as the adrenal glands, but that comes with the endocrine system. So here the kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra and the renal artery supplies blood to the kidney. And inside the kidney, all the excretory materials from the blood is taken into the kidney, urine is produced and the blood without these excretory materials come out through these veins. Can you see these two veins? Those are the renal veins. And these renal veins come out and open into the inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. So those are the parts of the excretory system that you should know to identify. The kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra, in addition to that the renal arteries that come from the systemic artery and the renal veins that open into the inferior vena cava. So those are the parts of the urinary system. So with that I will move on to the next. Okay students, so in this we can observe the urinary system. It has a pair of kidneys. Now here you can see these two bean shaped structures. Those are the kidneys. Now if you want to know where your kidneys are, if you place your hands on your hips like this, the thumbs facing backwards, the point where your thumbs touch, inside there is your kidney. So in case you get a pain there, you have to be careful. It shouldn't be related to the kidneys. So that is where our kidney is. In this, you can see clearly below the rib cage. You can see these are the rib bones, the rib cages. And here you can see the kidneys there. And you can see these tube-like structures. Those are the ureters and you can see the bladder and the urethra there. So these are the parts of the urinary system. If we rotate it also you can see it more clearly. Here they are on either side of the vertebral column. Here you can see the two bean shaped structures on either side of the vertebral column and the pair of ureters, the bladder as well as the urethra. So this is the basic structure, the parts of the urinary system. So students, you all know how the parts of the urinary system look like. The waste materials in blood enter through renal arteries. So you all saw in the diagram before what renal arteries are. They are the branches that come from the systemic artery. They are filtered inside the kidney. This is a term that you have to remember. They are filtered. Filtering means the waste materials are taken into the kidney. The blood without waste materials are given out through which blood vessel? Through the renal vein. The filtrate is known as urine. So here another new word filtrate and that is known as the urine. So that contains all the nitrogenous waste materials. It is transported through ureters and released out of the body through urethra. So there, that is the process that takes place within the body. Okay students, so this is the basic function. We'll be discussing that in detail. Again, we will look at the anatomy of the human body to see how the blood is supplied to the urinary system and how it flows out. So here you can see students in the Closer view, can you all see the structure? These are the adrenal glands. 
that are on top of the kidneys and here you can see the shape of the kidney clearly and also the outermost cover of the kidney. Here also you can see this dark brownish or maroonish color cover that is the capsule of the kidney. And then here can you all see this particular layer that is known as the cortex of the kidney and you all can see these triangle like structures or pyramid like structures those are known as the pyramids or renal pyramids. Then this structure this part is known as the renal pelvis and in between we have the medulla. So the capsule is the outer layer, then cortex, these are the renal pyramids and in between there, are, there is the medulla and this structure, this part is the pelvis and here you can see the ureters. So what happens is the renal artery, from the systemic artery, the renal arteries supply blood to the kidneys and inside the kidneys, there is a microscopic structure known as the nephron. There are about 1 million nephrons inside the kidneys. They are the functional units of kidney. Inside that only the urine is produced. And these nephrons are in between starting from the cortex and into the medulla as well as the pyramids. They are distributed throughout the kidneys. And when the urine is produced, that comes out into these structures. Can you see these structures like opening hole like structures? These structures, the urine goes, enters into it. And those are known as the collecting ducts. Through that, the urine enters into the pelvis. There the urine gets collected and then it enters into the ureters. Through the ureters, urine will be taken into the bladder where the urine is collected and whenever the bladder is full, you get the urge to pass urine and urine is excreted out. So now can you all understand the structure of kidneys? This is the cross-sectional view. Okay students, so you all saw the parts of the urinary system and you all were able to understand how blood is supplied and removed from the different parts. Then we have the next one where we observe the internal structure of a kidney and for that we require a model of the kidney. So this is a model of a kidney. So observe the above specimen carefully, identify the parts of the kidney. So this is something that we will be doing using the software. If as you all know, if we were in the lab, we will have the physical model where you can take it apart and observe the parts inside. But with the advance in technology, we have been using the anatomy software to observe all these parts. Now we will see the detailed structure of a part of a kidney. So now we will look at the parts of a human kidney. So I showed you all this structure. You all know what these are. This is one of the kidneys like this. There are two kidneys in a person that you know the right and the left kidney. So here if we look at the parts of the kidney, you can see, I will first label this diagram. So this part, that is the above this you saw, there were adrenal glands on each, one on top of each kidney. But this part, the outer cover of the kidney, that is known as the capsule of the kidney. Then I told you all this part. The lighter brown color region that is the cortex and what are these pyramid like structures or the triangle shaped structures from the shape you know they are the pyramids. And this is the vein 
that takes blood away from the kidneys that is called the renal vein renal vein and the artery that supplies blood is the renal artery and this part what was that called it is the pelvis and the ducts that are coming from all these parts they combine together and join and form the ureter so these are the parts that you can observe in a kidney and I, I told you all before the production of urine takes place within the kidney. So there should be a structural and functional unit inside the kidney and there is only one that is the structural and functional unit and that's called the nephron. So if you take one kidney, there are about 1 million nephrons inside a kidney. So we have two kidneys, so all together there are about 2 million nephrons in our body. That is in the urinary system. So here if we look at the structure of this in more detail, you can see here if we have taken a closer look, this part that is shown as a light color region is the cortex and the darker brown region that you see here is the medulla and this structure you can see a white color structure starting from here this complex structure is the nephron and this is the structural and functional unit of a kidney. So these are the parts that you need to know. When you are given the diagram, parts of a kidney and if it's more closer, you can observe the nephrons as well. You should know to label all these. The structural and functional unit of kidneys is the nephron. That is very important. You have to remember that. And nephron is a microscopic structure and there are about 1 million of them in a kidney. So they are very tiny structures. But those are the structures that produce the urine. So inside the kidney, urine is produced and that is done inside the nephron. So earlier we saw the parts of the urinary system, now the parts of a kidney, now we will see the parts of a nephron. So here we have the parts of a nephron. So these are the parts of the nephron, I told you all this is the structural and functional unit of the kidney and there are about 1 million nephrons in a kidney. So there are two kidneys in a person there are about 2 million nephrons and they are the structures that produce urine. So all the processes related to the production of urine takes place within this particular structure. So if you are given a diagram you should know to label them. So I will start with the blood vessel that supplies blood to the kidney. What is that called? That is the renal artery. So here you can see this structure that is the renal artery. So the renal artery supplies blood. You can see from the renal artery an arteriole goes there. And that arteriole is known as the afferent arteriole. So this is the afferent arteriole. Then you can see this afferent arteriole forms a dense network of capillaries here. And that structure is known as the glomerulus. So this is the glomerulus.
from the glomerulus you can see the arteriole goes out and that is known as the efferent arteriole. So here we have the efferent arteriole. So from this glomerulus, now blood enters through the renal artery into the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus. Inside that, the glomerulus is surrounded by this structure that is called the Bowman's capsule. So this blue color structure is known as the Bowman's capsule. So the blood comes through the renal artery and flows through the afferent arteriole and into the glomerulus. Around that you get the Bowman's capsule. So the blood gets filtered there. And the filtrate that comes out of the Bowman's capsule passes through this tubule. Here you can see this tube is a folded structure. So because it's folded, we call it the convoluted tubule and because it is closer to this side, we call it the proximal convoluted tubule. So that is the proximal convoluted luted tubule. that is this structure. So from the proximal convoluted tubule, you can see this long structure that is known as the descending limb. Descending limb. And this descending limb goes down and you can see this U-shaped structure that is known as the loop of Henle. Loop of Henle. And that tubule turns around and goes up like that and that part is known as the ascending limb. That is the ascending limb. So that here you can see it's going down, descending limb, descending limb, then the loop of Henle and here you see the ascending limb. Now this ascending limb goes up and forms another convoluted structure, the folded structure that is known as the distal convoluted tubule. At the same time, you can see here the artery that entered here, the afferent arteriole, comes out as the efferent arteriole and that forms a network of capillaries around the proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, the ascending and descending limbs and the loop of Henle. So this is a network of capillaries. So here we can say a network of capillaries. So that is this. And once the filtrate passes here, that becomes the urine and all the urine collects into this large duct. This is known as the collecting duct. So the blood that enters through the renal artery gets filtered, urine is produced, all the excretory materials are given to the urine and that is collected into the collecting duct. But the blood that entered the kidney 
Now it goes through all these capillary tubes, the network and finally you can see here all the capillary tubes joining together forming this blood vessel. That is the renal vein. So here we have the renal vein. So blood flows out through the renal vein. So these are all the parts of the nephron. And you all know nephron is the structural and functional unit of a kidney. So when you are given a diagram like this, you should know to identify all the structures and label them. So with that, we will move on to the process of production of urine, which takes place within this nephron. And that occurs in three stages. I will go on to that now. So the process of urine formation. Urine formation in kidney follows three main processes. So the first process I told you all from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule, there is a filtration process taking place and that is known as ultra filtration. It's ultra filtration. Then the second process where the filtrate from the Bowman's capsule that is called the Bowman's filtrate that passes through the descending up Henle's loop and the ascending up and also the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. There, there is selective reabsorption taking place. Selective reabsorption. So earlier there was the filtrate that comes out into the Bowman's capsule and that passes through the proximal convoluted tube and the descending and ascending limbs. There you saw the network of capillaries and into that this selective reabsorption. Some of the substances that were filtered get reabsorbed. And thereafter, there are some substances secreted into urine. So that is the third process. Secretion. So you have to remember students, process of urine formation takes place in three steps. Ultrafiltration, selective reabsorption and secretion. So we will first discuss the ultrafiltration process. Ultrafiltration. So here students, it is the renal artery that is going to supply blood to the kidneys. So these renal arteries divide into smaller arterioles. And those arterioles are known as the afferent arterioles. So each afferent arteriole enters into each Bowman's capsule. You know that is part of the nephron. So inside the Bowman's capsule, these arteries make a network-like structure that is known as the glomerulus, where they further divide forming a dense network of capillaries and it is known as glomerulus. The blood flow through the glomerulus is having a high blood pressure because the diameter of efferent arteriole is smaller than the diameter of afferent arteriole. I will explain all this with the diagram. So blood gets filtered through the wall of glomerulus and the inner wall of the Bowman's capsule and collected into the cavity of Bowman's capsule. So that is the process of ultrafiltration. This process is known as ultrafiltration. This filtered fluid is referred to as glomerular filtrate. 
and large molecules like plasma proteins and blood cells are not filtered into the glomerular filtrate. So that is the process. Now we will discuss this with the diagram. So here you can see the structure. This is part of the nephron. And in this, what is this arteriole? That is the afferent arteriole. Afferent arteriole. Afferent arteriole. So here what happens? The afferent arteriole enters into the Bowman's capsule and there is a network of capillaries. What do we call it? That is the glomerulus. So here we will have the glomerulus. So after the glomerulus, the arteriole comes out of the Bowman's capsule. And what is that called? That is the efferent arteriole. So what you see here is the efferent arteriole. So the glomerulus is present within this structure. What did we call it? It was the Bowman's capsule. So here we have the Bowman's capsule. So what will happen is blood will flow through the afferent arteriole. Here you can see the thickness or the diameter of the afferent arteriole is larger compared to this afferent arteriole. And it will circulate through the glomerulus. At that time, substances from blood plasma get filtered into this Bowman's capsule. So here you can see the blood flow that is denoted by these arrows. And here you can see these arrows indicate the filtering process. That is what we call as ultrafiltration. So once the filtration process takes place, what we get here is known as the glomerular filtrate. That is what enters into this part. What is this part? That is the beginning of the proximal convoluted tubule. So we can indicate it as tubule. So as you can see blood is flowing through the arterioles and inside we have the glomerulus network of capillaries. There is filtration process taking place and we called it Ultra filtration. Why do we call it ultra filtration? Because blood is filtered under high pressure. And this pressure is created by these two arterioles. I told you all that the afferent arteriole, this is afferent arteriole, is larger than the efferent arteriole. And here we have the glomerulus. So all the blood, the larger volume of blood that is flowing through the afferent arteriole has to flow through this small afferent arteriole. So when a larger volume has to flow through a smaller space that has to flow with high pressure. So that is how pressure is increased within the glomerulus. So because of that, substances get filtered efficiently. So we call it the ultra filtration process. So that is what takes place within this structure. So here, now if we look at the full structure, you can see 
the blood flow through the glomerulus is having high blood pressure because the diameter of efferent arteriole is smaller than the diameter of afferent arteriole. Efferent is smaller than the afferent arteriole. So, blood gets filtered through the wall of glomerulus and the inner wall of the Bowman's capsule. So, this is the wall of glomerulus and this is the inner wall of the Bowman's capsule. So, there are only very thin walls, two walls, but which are very, very thin. So, the substances can be filtered through it easily. This process is known as ultrafiltration. And this filtered fluid is referred to as glomerular filtrate. And here, when substances get filtered, they have to pass through the cells, the cell layer. And through that, large molecules and large components cannot be filtered. So because of that, plasma proteins and blood cells, like red blood cells, white blood cells, they will not be filtered into the glomerular filtrate. So large molecules like plasma proteins and blood cells are not filtered into the glomerular filtrate. So if we look at the two substances, here we have blood and here we have glomerular filtrate. So the glomerular filtrate, it's similar to the blood plasma except it does not have the blood cells as well as the plasma protein. The rest of the substances are similar to plasma. So once the glomerular filtrate enters the tubule, it will pass through the proximal convoluted tubule, then through the descending limb and the ascending limb through the Henle's loop. There the second process will take place. Okay students, so now that you have understood the process of ultrafiltration, we will move on to the next process that takes place inside the nephrons. So then the substances that are not filtered through the glomerulus. So you Understood, we discussed before students in the previous slide, the wall of the glomerulus because it's, it is a capillary network and the Bowman's capsule are very thin walls. So substances get filtered into the Bowman's capsule and that is what is known as the glomerular filtrate. Into that, the large components of blood, that is the plasma protein and the blood cells do not get filtered into the Bowman's capsule. So substances that are not filtered through the glomerulus are the plasma proteins, plasma proteins and blood cells. These are not filtered. If they are getting filtered means your kidney is not functioning properly. So in a healthy person when there is filtration through the glomerulus, plasma proteins and blood cells do not enter into the glomerular filtrate. So then if you look at the structure or the composition of the glomerular filtrate, glomerular filtrate is same as blood plasma, but it doesn't have the plasma proteins or the blood cells. That is very important. So what are the constituents of this glomerular filtrate. It will have water, it will have glucose, then amino acids, water, glucose, amino acids, the drugs can be present vitamins various ions 
and urea. So now if we look at the constituents of glomerular filtrate, there is water that is the main component we can say, then there is glucose that is filtered from blood, then amino acids, drugs, vitamins, various ions and urea. What is this urea? It is the nitrogenous excretory product of our body. That is what needs to be excreted mainly. So these are the components of the glomerular filtrate. And all these are not excreted from our body. Now you know in a healthy person, glucose cannot be excreted with urine. So all these have to be reabsorbed by our body. So that is the second process of urine production. We discussed there are three processes. The first one was ultrafiltration. That is what we discussed before. Now we are moving on to the next step or the second stage of urine production. That is selective reabsorption. So I will move on to the next slide. So the second process of urine production, selective reabsorption. So the main part of the nephron that involves in selective reabsorption is this part. This is the descending limb, loop of Henle and ascending limb. So what is this students? What you see here? This is the afferent arteriole. Afferent arteriole. Then here we discuss the blood vessel that is coming out that is the efferent arteriole. So efferent arteriole goes in and forms the network of capillary. What is that? It is the glomerulus. And then here what do you have? This is the Bowman's capsule. Capsule. So here through the glomerulus, blood gets filtered into this part. What is this part? This is the tubule. So here you can see this part of the tubule. That is the proximal convoluted tubule proximal convoluted tubule. That is this structure. So through the proximal convoluted tubule, when the glomerular filtrate enters into this part, what is this part? The descending limb. Then only selective reabsorption takes place. What are the substances that are reabsorbed? If we look at the substances that are reabsorbed, 90% water is reabsorbed. So water was the main constituent. Then 100% of glucose. Now I told you all, in a healthy person, there can be no glucose in the urine. So 100% of glucose has to be reabsorbed. In addition to that, there were some minerals that came into the glomerular filtrate. So some amount of minerals, some amount of minerals will be reabsorbed. But some of them can be excreted with urine. Then there is amino acid. Amino acid is also reabsorbed because amino acid again cannot be excreted with urine. So amino acid is reabsorbed. In addition to that, a small amount of or some amount of, of urea is reabsorbed. In addition to that, the vitamins are also reabsorbed. So can you all understand the substances? 90% water. So ma'am, the higher amount of water is reabsorbed from the glomerular filtrate. Then 100% glucose is reabsorbed. 
some amount of minerals are reabsorbed, amino acid, some amount of urea and vitamins are reabsorbed. Now urea you all know is the main nitrogenous excretory waste product. So that has to be excreted with urine. So after that what happens here? Now this is the again the structure of the nephron that you all know very well. So while the glomerular filtrate is traveling through this part, all these substances are reabsorbed. Then it comes to the loop of Henle, they are after the ascending limb and the distal convoluted tibule. So when it goes towards that part, then it is the third stage of urine production. What is that? Secretion. So before we go to that, I will move on to the next slide. Now here you can see when glomerular filtrate moves along the nephron. So here it is the glomerular filtrate that moves along the nephron. Most of the constituents absorb again into the blood capillaries. So they are absorbed into the blood capillaries associated with nephron. And this process is what we call as selective reabsorption. So as I told you all before, 90% of the water is selectively reabsorbed. But 100% glucose, 100% of glucose is reabsorbed. Then if you look at the components, you can see amino acids are reabsorbed, vitamins, part of salts, small amount of urea, even uric acid and drugs are also reabsorbed during the selective reabsorption process. Where that, does that take place? Inside the descending limb. Around the descending limb you can remember the afferent arteriole. Afferent arteriole comes out and forms a network around the ascending and descending limbs. So into that all these substances are reabsorbed. So reabsorbed into blood. So the composition of glomerular filtrate change with selective reabsorption. This is important. Earlier the glomerular filtrate had a lot of substances. Now the composition has changed. Then the glomerular filtrate is released into the collecting ducts. So I told you all, all the urine that is produced within the kidney will be released into the collecting duct and then to the pelvis. This you can remember when we looked at the structure of the kidney also I explained. Through the collecting ducts urine is taken into the pelvis. From the pelvis it enters into the ureters. So the volume of glomerular filtrate formed during one minute. In a day, in a healthy person, there is a certain amount of glomerular filtrate. Now, this glomerular filtrate formed during one minute in a healthy adult is about 120 centimeter cubes. That is in one minute. That you have to remember, students. In a minute, 120 centimeter cubes of glomerular filtrate is produced. But from that, 95% of the glomerular filtrate reabsorb when it moves along the nephron. Why you can see about 90% of water is reabsorbed. 100% glucose, amino acids, vitamins, salts, amount of urea, uric acid, drugs, all these are reabsorbed. So about 95% of the glomerular filtrate is reabsorbed. So only a small amount, 120 out of this 120 centimeter cube, only a small amount becomes the urine. But throughout the ray, urine is produced. And from all the nephrons, they enter into the collecting duct. From the collecting duct, it enters into the pelvis. Through the pelvis, it goes into the ureters and gets collected inside the bladder. And when the bladder is full, you get the urge to pass urine. When it is full lost, when there is a certain amount of urine, then you get the urge to pass urine. So at that time, you have to make sure you pass urine. Otherwise, preventing or postponing urination is also not good for our so that is the process of urine production.
So first we discuss the ultrafiltration, then this process that is the selective reabsorption. There is another process that is the third stage of urine production. What is that? That is the secretion. So here we said it is moving through the nephron into the collecting ducts. But while it is moving through the nephron inside the distal convoluted tubule, ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule within that part there is secretion. So that is what we are going to discuss next. So 100% of glucose is reabsorbed in a healthy adult that we discussed before. If it does not get reabsorbed, then the condition is due to diabetes. So, but in diabetic patients, glucose is not totally reabsorbed and the remaining glucose is released with urine. So, that is why normally by doing a urine test, they can identify whether a person has diabetes or not. You can identify it using a blood test as well. But here, glucose will be excreted with urine in the condition of diabetes. So, only in a diabetic patient, there can be glucose in urine. In a healthy person, there will be no glucose in urine. With that, we will move on to the next part where we discuss the secretion. So, this is the third step of urine production. We have discussed ultrafiltration, selective reabsorption and now secretion. Some of the materials in the blood capillaries associated with nephron enter the tubules of nephron. This process is known as secretion. So earlier it was from the tubules substances were reabsorbed into the blood capillaries. But here from the blood capillaries substances are secreted into the tubules. So that process is known as secretion. So here you can see hydrogen ions, potassium ions, ammonium ions, all three are ions and creatinine, drugs and vitamin B. These are the substances that are secreted into urine. So these can be excreted or these are excreted with urine. So here you can see vitamins earlier it was reabsorbed but again it is secreted. So when all this is done that is inside the convoluted tubule that is the distal convoluted tubule. Once everything has been reabsorbed and the secretions take place we call it the urine. So now it has to be excreted from the kidneys or it has to be excreted from our body. So now let's see removal of urine from the body. So you can remember students the three processes ultrafiltration, selective reabsorption and secretion. So after that the urine is collected into the collecting duct. From there it enters the pelvis of the kidneys and from there it enters the ureters. And through the ureters urine is transported and stored temporarily inside the bladder. And bladder gets filled up. It's a somewhat flexible org organ so the size of the bladder can increase and when it reaches a certain point, you feel the urge to pass urine. So depending on the urge or the necessity, the urine is excreted out through the urethra. That is the opening of the bladder. So here, urine released into the pelvis is transported along ureters into bladder. 
So you are familiar with all these terms. The pelvis, ureters and the bladder. And is stored temporarily in bladder. So here this is a temporary storage. Release of urine takes place according to the need of urination. So as I said, when you get the urge to pass urine, it is excreted out. So the composition of urine in a healthy person will be like this. After the selective reabsorption as well as the secretion, it will have the main constituent water. So here you can see about 96% is water. Salts, there are only 2% of salt. You saw that some are reabsorbed and some ions are secreted. Then there is urea that is also about 2%. That is the main nitrogenous waste product. Then uric acid that also trace amount. That is also a nitrogenous waste product. Creatinine, another substance that is secreted into the tubules. So that is also present in trace amounts. Trace means very little amount. So that is the composition of urine. So you all know what happens inside the kidneys. So that is the part of the urinary system where urine is produced. And you all know the structural and functional unit that is the nephron and the three processes that take place within the nephron during the production of urine. So after that urine is excreted from the body. With that I will move on to the diseases associated with urinary system. So here again to remind you all the parts of the urinary system. You remember the two kidneys. What are these? A pair of ureters, the bladder and the urethra. So here substances are filtered and substances are reabsorbed. Then substances are secreted. So this is also a complex process. And I told you all. When there is too much of water in the body, more water is excreted with urine. When there is not enough water, more water is reabsorbed and the urine output will decrease. So based on the condition of your body, the amount of urine that is produced will vary. So because of that, if there are or Let's say you are exposed to conditions or due to your lifestyle. If you don't drink enough water, then too much of water has to be reabsorbed and less urine will be produced. Then the urine will be more concentrated with all the components. That can affect the kidneys. So due to that, there can be an effect in the kidney. Then we said in diabetic patients, glucose is filtered but it is not reabsorbed. So the diabetes condition affects the function of the kidney. In addition to that, now all the water that you drink is getting filtered. Part of the water is getting filtered. So if there are microorganisms, those microorganisms can infect the kidney. So all that can cause problems in the kidney. And here in the water that you drink, if there is this substance calcium oxalate, that can deposit in the kidneys and form calcula. So that is also another condition. So urine infection that is due to microorganisms can take place in any part of the urinary system but mainly the kidneys. So if there is infection you will get different symptoms. 
The urine can be darker in color. You can feel a burning sensation while passing urine. You might get a pain at your back or the abdomen. You all know where the kidneys are. I told you all when I explained the urinary system. If you place your hands on your hips with the thumb facing backward, you can feel the place where the kidneys are. You can't feel the kidneys. That is the position of the kidneys. So if you get a pain there all the time, then you have to be careful. It could be a problem or a disease related to the urinary system. And if neglected or if it continues due to many other diseases like diabetes, if you are a diabetic patient for a long time, then that also can affect the kidneys. That can lead to renal failure. And this can be of two types the acute renal failure and the chronic renal failure. Acute is a sudden thing. Within few days, the failure can develop and the kidneys can fail. If it is chronic, that is over a long period of time. So the renal failure can really damage the kidneys. So this is a system that is necessary to excrete all the unwanted substances out of the body. Those are the excretory substances. So if this doesn't function properly, then of course all these excretory products will remain within the body. That can be very harmful to the body. So we have to maintain a healthy lifestyle. That means you have to drink enough water, at the same time, whenever you feel like passing urine, if you are a healthy person, you should not postpone urination. By doing those two mainly, you can maintain the health of the urinary system to a certain extent. When I mean healthy lifestyle, all the other factors that are included in a healthy lifestyle. With that introduction, now I will discuss the diseases associated to the urinary system. The first one, some of the diseases associated with the urinary system in that the first one is renal failure. I discussed renal failure. I told you all there are two types. One is the acute renal failure all of a sudden within few days. The kidneys fail and the function doesn't occur properly or it can be over a long period of time. That is known as chronic renal failure. So kidneys fail to function due to the weakening of urine filtration process in nephrons. So the nephrons are the basic structural and functional units. When they stop functioning, the kidneys don't filter urine properly. So that is where this renal failure takes place. And the factors that cause renal failure, there are different factors. Infections by microorganisms. So I told you all there can be infections. You know the pathogens, different pathogens can enter into the kidney. They can infect the kidney. That can cause renal failure. If it's a very severe infection, the kidney function can be completely disturbed. Then heavy metals. You know what metals are? Heavy metals are the metals that have a very high mass, atomic mass or mass number like mercury and arsenic. They can cause renal failure. Then there are various medicines. So that is the reason you should not take medicines without the doctor's advice and also if they tell you to only take it for a certain period of time, say one week, you shouldn't repeat that over a long period of time or without the doctor's advice, you should not repeat that medication. And if you are a let's say diabetic patient and you are taking medicines for diabetes, then you will have to take the medicine for a long period of time or lifelong. Then you should make sure that you check your kidneys. 
to make sure that they are functioning properly. Otherwise, some of the drugs, various medicines can lead to renal failure. Then carbon tetrachloride. This is a chemical substance. You are familiar with carbon tetrachloride. You know it is a non-polar organic solvent. So that also can cause renal failure. So these are the factors that cause renal failure. Now we will see the basic symptoms that can be observed during renal failure. Odema, an increase of blood pressure due to accumulation of water and salts. Odema means the swelling of legs or hands and the face. So when there is not enough filtration or improper filtration taking place in the kidneys, what happens is there is more water retained within the body. Urine will not pass enough. So there will be water retaining in the body and that will accumulate in various parts of the tissues of the body. So the swelling that you observe is known as oedema. An increase of blood pressure. So one symptom is oedema. The other one means increase of blood pressure. That is also due to the accumulation of water or fluid inside the cells as well as parts of the body. Then the pH of blood decreases due to accumulation of urea and other excretory materials. So when we say pH of blood, there should be a certain pH for blood. Do you all know the pH value of blood? It is 7.4. So if you are a healthy person, the pH has to be 7.4. If it decreases, that is due to or one reason is renal failure. So by taking immediate treatments and healthy lifestyle, one can maintain a healthy kidney. So there are many reasons or various causes for renal failure. You cannot avoid pathogens all together or you cannot avoid heavy metals completely. Sometimes without your knowledge you are exposed to that. So if you get a renal failure, a disease associated with the kidney, if you seek immediate medical attention, then you can prevent further damage. If treatments are not taken immediately after the symptoms, acute renal failure may occur. So I told you all, acute, all of a sudden the kidney completely fails within 8 to 14 days. Then blood is filtered by a machine in a process called dialysis. So in acute renal failure, the renal failure cannot be reverse sometimes. So that means your kidney stops functioning completely. There are two kidneys but a person can survive just with one kidney. But if both the kidneys fail or their function decreases then of course you have to do this dialysis process. Dialysis is where the blood is filtered by a machine because your kidney cannot filter it. The machine does the filtering process. If that also doesn't work, sometimes the person has to be donated or transplanted with a kidney. So when both kidneys are failed, a healthy kidney from a donor should be transplanted. So this is also a process. You can live with one functioning kidney. But if both your kidneys fail or if one kidney fails and the function of the other kidney is also less, then we can go for dialysis. If both kidneys fail, you will have to go for a kidney transplant. So you can see how severe this disease can become. It can become fatal too. So you have to be careful, you have to maintain the health of the kidney.
with that I will move on to the next disease that is nephritis. So nephritis or swelling of kidney occurs due to infections and toxins. Infections you know are microorganisms or pathogens and toxins or toxic substances are poisonous substances. Substances that can be poisonous or harmful to the kidney. So infections in ureters and other changes that occur in the body are reasons for nephritis. So here it is the ureters that get infected. So due to other changes in the body also it can result in nephritis. So if you have this nephritis condition that will lead to these changes in the nephrons or the kidneys. The glomerulus and uriniferous tubules are affected. Those are the ureters, uriniferous tubules. So both the glomerulus and the uriniferous tubules are affected during nephritis. And due to the damages in glomerulus, volume of blood flow through it reduces. So you know the ultrafiltration process takes place within the glomerulus. From the glomerulus, it's filtered into Bowman's capsule. So the volume of blood that is filtered will reduce, decrease. So that means the urine production also decreases. So the amount of urine formed also reduces. So the urine formed also reduces. Therefore, the waste materials are remaining within the body become high. So as I told you all before, if the kidney doesn't function properly, the waste materials are retained within the body. Sometimes due to damages that occur in glomerular, glomerules, filtering process is affected and as a result, red blood cells can be passed into the glomerular filtrate. This is very, very important. Normally, you all know there are two substances that are not filtered into the Bowman's capsule. What were they? The plasma protein and the blood cells. But when the glomerulus is affected, it doesn't filter properly. The red blood cells can pass through the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. So that can be very, very dangerous. Similarly, proteins also can be filtered. And due to loss of these essential proteins, strokes may occur. You know what stroke is. There is a dysfunction in the brain that paralyzes part of your body or the full body. So the stroke can sometimes become fatal also. So that can occur due to the filtering of the blood protein or the plasma protein. And even the red blood cells getting filtered is not a good sign. So that means your kidneys are not functioning properly. So you can see again here, this is also a very severe condition. So students, remember any disease except the normal infection, especially the renal failure and nephritis can become dangerous or fatal. So you have to make sure that you get proper medical attention. With that, I will move on to the next type of disease that is calculi in kidney and bladder. You know what calculi is? In normal terms, we call it the stones in the kidney or stones in the bladder. That is what we mean by calculi in kidney and bladder. So this can form in any part of the urinary tract. This is due to calcium oxalate. That is a substance, a chemical compound. So crystallization of calcium oxalate in kidneys and bladder is the reason for this condition. So when there is lot of calcium oxalate in the food or water that you drink, they will all go and deposit inside the kidney or the bladder 
and that can form into larger crystals known as the calcula and that can lead to problems. When these stones block ureters, so when these stones block the ureters, you will get a severe pain. Then only you will know that there are calcula in the urinary system. And we have discussed this process, one of the methods of removing calculi. What was that? Can you all remember? The use of ultrasound. And what did we call that process? It's given here also lithotripsy. So here, removal of these stones can be done by drugs or surgery. Normally, initially they tell you to drink a lot of water. Sometimes with lot of water, the calculi gets flushed. Otherwise, you are treated with drugs. If that doesn't help, we might have to go for a surgery where the calculi are removed. Or else, the stones can be crushed by, they can be crushed by applying laser rays or ultrasound waves. And this technique is called lithotripsy technology. So we have discussed that before and you all know how that is done to a certain extent. So if we look at the reasons for these stones, two main reasons, the feeding habit of a person. If you are used to consuming food that contain this calcium oxalate in high amounts, that can lead to the formation of calculi. Otherwise, the postponing of urination. If, if you get the urge to pass urine, you have to pass urine. If you postpone it, just once is okay. But as a regular practice, if you postpone urination, urine will retain within the bladder. Then the calcium oxalate, those are ions, minerals they tend to deposit inside the bladder. Then that can lead to calculi formation. So to avoid this, you have to have a healthy eating habit and you have to drink enough water and also you need to pass urine whenever you get the urge. So drinking of required volume of water daily is helpful to avoid this condition. So by doing this, you can prevent the calculi in kidney and blood. So with that students, I have come to the end of discussion on urinary system. So we started off by discussing the three organs that act as excretory organs and the excretory products and how they are excreted. Then we discuss the main nitrogenous waste excretory organ that is the kidney that belongs to the urinary system. So you know the parts of the urinary system, then you know the structural and functional unit of the urinary system that is the nephron. So if you are given the diagrams, you know to label them. Then we discuss the three steps of urine production and now the diseases associated with the urinary system. So as you know this is a very important system. All the systems are important. This is also a very important system and it is our duty to maintain the system in a healthy manner by having these healthy habits. So with that, I will finish my discussion on urinary system.